I've always known about hardiness zones and frost dates and how important they are for planning your outdoor garden, but I'm going to be real with you, plant friend. I really never understood what those numbers and words meant and why they were so important. I've definitely gotten as far as typing my zip code into the hardiness zone website, getting my number, and then pretty much not doing anything with it aside for a couple of Google searches. So as I look to plan my first grown-up garden this summer at our new house, which I'm so excited about, I knew I needed help. So I asked Rochelle Grayer of the renowned garden design website Pith and Vigor, who has years of garden design under her belt. I am so excited to launch this My First Garden series and have Rochelle be my first guest. She is so knowledgeable on this topic that I think confuses a lot of beginner gardens, and she breaks it all down for us to better understand our outdoor environments and help us bloom and grow. So many light bulb moments in this episode plan, friends. I'm almost embarrassed for what you're about to hear, but I'm also so excited. So let's dive right into episode 118 of Bloom and Grow Radio. Here's a quick thanks to our episode sponsors. Espoma Organics is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. They have an amazing line of indoor and outdoor gardening products in eco-friendly packaging with zero waste commitments and are a fourth generation family-run business. To learn more about all of the amazing indoor and outdoor gardening products Espoma has to offer, visit espoma.com to find your local Espoma dealer. Or visit the link in the show notes for my Amazon storefront of my favorite Asmoma picks. Territorial Seed Company is the go-to option for seeds and plants for your garden this summer. Plant friends. They are awesome. They help us grow beautiful, productive gardens 12 months a year with their unbelievable selection of seeds and plants that they extensively test to ensure that they yield the best tasting, best producing, highest quality vegetables, flowers, and herbs. I will be using them for my garden this year, and I am so excited. Check out their amazing variety of seeds, plants, garden planters, and more at TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout to get 10 10% off your first order. Once again, that's code BLOOM10 at checkout at territorialseed.com for 10% off your first order. Okay, before we dive into this episode, plan friends, I just wanted to check in with you and see what social channels you are on right now because I'm pumping out a lot of really fun, really silly, planty content across a lot of channels. And I know I am primarily a podcaster, but you might not know that I create planty content across a lot of different boards. So if you are on Instagram, I am there. And that is probably my silliest. My stories are my silliest. I'm currently obsessed with the deer on my property if you tune into my stories. If you're on Clubhouse, I've actually got my own club called Houseplant Plant Parents that I'm co-hosting with my friend Agatha, who's Plant Ma on Instagram. And we're about to start weekly meetups for podcast listeners. So um, make sure to go follow us if you are on Clubhouse. And if you need an invite, slide into my DMs. And I have several invites that I'm happy to share with you guys. I'm also on TikTok doing Lord knows what. And of course, the YouTube channel. Last week on the YouTube channel, I released a really fun episode on a DIY fern terrarium I did in a, I guess we'll say, plight to try and stop killing ferns. It's really fun, and I show you this cool experiment I did. And we've got fun vlogs on the YouTube channel all the time, so make sure you check it out and subscribe. I'm just trying to bloom and grow and reach as many planty people as possible to help all of us cultivate more joy in our lives, so join me on all the channels. Thank you so much to our Patreon plant friends. The plant friends are a group of listeners around the world who support Bloom and Grow Radio on a monetary basis every month. The newest Patreon plant friends are Theodate Miranda, Emmy Givens, Ashley Pilla, and Kathy Van Wert. Thank you so very much for joining the unbelievable little tribe of people supporting the show. We are going to have a really exciting launch of something super de duper exciting in the next two months. And the current Patreon members are going to get first dibs. And some of the members are actually already beta testing it for me, my tried and true members. So if you're interested in joining as a Patreon, I might suggest joining in the next month so you could maybe take advantage of a super fun surprise little offering I'm going to give our Patreon supporters. Anyway. This conversation with Rochelle is so good. Plant friends, I'm a novice again at gardening. I now kind of know what I'm doing as a houseplant parent, but I feel like back in the beginning 10 episodes of Bloom and Grow where I was a true novice to houseplants, I'm now a true novice to gardening. And I have 
some really awesome guests on the podcast for the summer on a series that I'm calling My First Garden. And the My First Garden series is interviewing gardening experts about how to do your garden right. And the first thing I knew I wanted to tackle was this concept of hardiness zones because I think it's kind of confusing to a lot of people. And Rochelle shines so much light on the concept and alternatives and what to do with this information we're given. The conversation's so good. Why am I just talking about it? Let's just get right into it. So here's Rochelle. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio, Rochelle. Oh, thank you. So happy to have you here. You have such an interesting journey to becoming the professional plant lady that you are. Do you want to kind of run us through how you became the epic woman behind Pith and Vigor? Sure. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut and a pilot. I was completely obsessed with this. So I went to college and got my degree in applied physics, graduated, got my pilot's license, worked for Hughes Aircraft and Raytheon for a while, did all kinds of things with F-18 flight simulators and satellites and things like that. But then over some years, I got promoted doing other sort of software things and really didn't love it as much as I once did. I never became an astronaut obviously. Mm -hmm. Basically got to a point where I was really ready for a change. And I was living in England at the time. And I went to the Chelsea Flower Show and I was kind of casting about like, what's my next move? Like I need a massive career change. And I'd always been a gardener and I grew up with gardening parents, gardening grandparents, like families, ranchers and farmers and that kind of thing in the West. And The idea of a designer, though, was like this completely foreign thing to me. I never even knew it existed. They're like people who grow food for a living, like they don't hire designers. Mm. It just was this like crazy thing. Anyway, Chelsea's a bit like going to Paris Fashion Week. And it was completely eye opening and mind boggling. And I knew that day that this was like my next move. And so I went to design school in England, complete career change. And that was. 19 years ago. And so since then, I started my own business as a designer immediately. Well, actually, even before I graduated, I had some clients that were wanting to hire me. And I've since um, been a garden designer for many years. I've done all kinds of things, written books, launched magazines and newspapers, done many issues of those. And now I do a lot of teaching, teaching garden design. And I talk about plants on television. So it's been just this kind of constant evolution. That's awesome. You were just telling me, so you are a plant lady on HSN in addition to managing your own brand. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Whenever plants come on HSN, that's me talking about them. So tis the season right now. It's about to go crazy with many, many plant segments over the next few months, like constantly. So all those plants back there, they're all going on TV this week. So That is so fun. So when you say garden design, are you talking about individual gardens? Like I would call you to do my tiny little garden on my home, or are we talking gardens like public works and more public commercially owned properties? So my practice that I kind of focused in on two things, I did a lot of residential About half of my work was always residential. And then the other half, I focused on hospitality projects. So I did a lot of gardens for hotels and restaurants and spas. And I worked with architects who were working on those. So kind of as a subcontractor to them doing design work. So those were my two main focuses, which I kind of liked because I love sort of that intimacy of people doing their own spaces and getting creative and funky with their own imaginations, like whatever they want to do. I mean, I just love a good hotel. So Hmm. (laughs) being able to create some of the more interesting, you know, places that we like to visit like that, always really fun too. Totally different kind of design though. I went to this unbelievable luxe hotel estate I think it's called like the Inn at Rancho Santa Fe and in California, and they have Mm -hmm. a spa on the property and they had hedges of rosemary. Oh, and it was the most exquisite experience to, as you were walking into the spa, literally just get like accosted with fragrance, with rosemary fragrance from like enormous hedges of rosemary. I had never even thought of rosemary as a bush before, you know, because you think about it as those little tiny plants that you get at the grocery store. And it really just goes to show, and they had an unbelievable farm to table garden set up a huge garden where they grow everything in house. And it really goes to show how much having that biophilic aspect really enhances guests' experience and my experience at the spa for sure. 
but yeah, it's important work. And I think also it's such an interesting profession for people to go into who are super interested in becoming a plant person professionally and not really knowing how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways that you can go into the realm of being a plant person professionally. There's obviously horticulture jobs. There's as like breeders and kind of deep in some science of plant propagation and stuff like that. And then there's people who work at like public gardens and keeping that those types of places amazing, as well as other levels of science. I always think of that as like one end and there's this kind of this rainbow of jobs in between. Whereas design on my end is like, sometimes I feel like I relate as much to like an architect or interior designer or something as much as I relate to like the whole horticultural end too. So there's a huge range of things you could do in the plant world. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm just so freaking excited to have you as my first guest on the My First Garden series to tackle this topic that has always baffled me. The first thing I knew I wanted to tackle when approaching the series was garden zones and what the heck they are and why the heck we need to understand them and all of the weird minutia that comes along with it. I think garden zones can be really intimidating. People can kind of glaze over when you start talking about them, but from what Mm -hmm. I've researched, they can be super instrumental tools to helping us achieve success in our gardens. And I'm looking to have a successful garden the first time around. I'm not looking to do this the wrong way this time. So what the heck is a hardiness zone? And yeah, let's go there. Yeah, there's a few things, but just to start with hardiness zones. The hardiness zones are, they're bands basically. So there's 13 of them. Actually, there's more than 13, but there's basically 13 of them. And what the USDA, so this is a government sort of thing they've done, is broken down by 10 degree bands, how an average temperature, I think it's based on cold, not hot. So what's the average coldest temperature that a place gets? And they do this so that we can talk about our plants because plants can be intolerant of cold. And so if we know the average temperature of a place, then we can kind of make a determination of does that place get too cold for a plant that has like, if it gets to zero degrees here where I live all the time, this plant can tolerate things down to 10 degrees. We know that. So that plant's probably going to be okay. But instead of having to deal with all of that, knowledge of degrees, we just put it into zones. And so there's pros and cons to it. The pros are that it's nice and simple. Like I can say to you, well, I'm zone six and that can mean something and we can keep plant tags very simple. So you'll see it on plant tags or when you research a plant you want me to buy, it'll say party to zone some number. And the lower the zone, the colder it is. So way, way up North or it would be zone one and way, way down South would be like zone 13 if you can get that far south. So there's a range and it's not bands like linear bands. They swirl around, you know, so it's warmer. Near- kind of kaleidoscopy. Yeah. Yeah. It's warmer near bodies of water and stuff like that. And higher elevations might find it colder and stuff like that. But it is, the USDA zones are just based on temperature. That's it. And it's an average temperature at that. So the drawback of that is that Oh, and well, before I say that, so I said there's 13 of them and there's kind of more because you'll see sometimes like 6A, 6B. Yes, yes. So that kind of makes it more like almost double. And the A and B, they're breaking it down into five degree bands. So they took that 10 degrees. And so if you're an A, you're on like the warmer side. If you're a B, you're on the colder side of that band. That's how that works. And they're just averages though. So the problem with an average is that a place that's like, always 60 degrees would have an average of 60 degrees, but so would a place that also has a temperature of 120 and zero, right? Mm -hmm. That's a really different thing as far as a plant's concerned. So there are drawbacks to the zones as they are. I mean, we don't have a lot of places that go from zero to 120, but you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and understand that there's more to it than just your hardiness zone. Look at what just happened in Dallas. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (gasps) Yeah. Especially lately with climate change, we have these real outliers that extremes of cold and extremes of heat. And the extremes are what really matter to plants. Extremes of cold and extremes of heat can really do a plant in completely. So that average is very useful, but 
I always tell people it's a likelihood thing. It's not a promise. <laughs> so, okay. You want to take that as guidance, but just because a plant is good for zone six, like I'm zone six, doesn't mean it's going to live in my garden. It's more likely to live in my garden. It's not a perfect science. So there are some other things. There are other things to look at. So there's another thing. You don't see it very often, but it does exist. The AHS, the American Horticultural Society, trying to resolve that heat zone thing. They tried to say instead, so that the average problem, they did a different calculation. And that is they have zones and I forget how many are in there, but they count the number of days over 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And they give you a zone based on that. So they can be similar to the USDA zones, but they're a little bit different. And they're trying to kind of give you a little more information about that heat index, which is that's be what's really... going to like fry your plants. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I almost never use the AHS ones and I don't see them very often on plants. So while it does exist, and I think you could probably Google and find out the AHS zone for most plants, you don't see it very often. So I never use it. Most people use the USDA zone. So, and you can figure out your USDA zone pretty easily. You just Google like USDA hardiness zone and the USDA has a website and you just put your zip code in and it'll tell you exactly what your zone is. I'd love to troubleshoot my zone with you a little bit at the end of this conversation, but it's interesting. So you said you're zone six, I'm zone Mm -hmm. 5B. So that means that my zone has a colder average than yours by just a little bit. By just a little bit, yep. And also we should have zoomed out. I should have zoomed out in the beginning. Hardiness in general means like kind of a plant's ability to survive, right? Like when we say a plant is very hardy, it means a plant that can survive. So these hardiness zones are basically zones determining how easy it would be for a plant to survive. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, very cool. We should have said that in the beginning, yes. Okay, so we can go on the USDA website. It's so easy. You just type in your zip code and you get it. Yep. Okay, so my zone is 5B, cool. Yeah. Like, what do I do with that information? Zones come in a lot more with perennials, trees and shrubs rather than annuals. Annuals are things that you're gonna be planting every year anyway. And so you need to take some different considerations into that, like last frost dates and things like that for the most part. The zone, when you buy a plant, particularly like a perennial tree or shrub, it will tell you the zones. And so long as you, that it's good for, it'll say zone seven. If it says zone seven, that means it's seven and above. So that wouldn't be a good plant for you. Okay. Very likely because you're below seven. And that just means that it's not going to overwinter likely. You can plant, I I mean, I take all my house plants, none of those are hardy where I live, but they're fine in my house all winter. Mm -hmm. I take them outside for the summer and then I bring them back in for the winter. So it's usually, it's about the coldness typically that makes something not able to be hardy. Okay. So when I get a plant and it says zone seven, that doesn't mean that the plant can only be planted in zone seven. That means it could be planted in zone seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. (laughs) All right. We're solving problems here left and right. Because I remember on my balcony garden once, I think I'm 7B when I used to live in New York City. And Mm -hmm. I think I remember seeing it being zone six, me being like, well, why can't I plant this in, you know, I think it was like a tomato or something. And I remember being like, well, why can't I plant this? But it meant six and up, duh. Because it's about the cold, surviving the cold throughout the dormant season. So for a perennial. Okay. (laughs) That makes sense. So that's the first thing you have to understand about it. So it's for choosing perennials. I mean, is it helpful when choosing annuals at all or no? Yeah. I mean, sometimes they don't even list hardiness zones on annuals because there's no point to it, presumably. But then there's lots of plants that are perennial in some places or annuals in others. And that is straight up to the hardiness zone. So you'll see that a lot. Like like a strawberry that like couldn't live through a super cold winter or something. Right, right. Or even rosemary. You brought up rosemary. Rosemary is an annual where you and I live, but in Southern California is a perennial Mm -hmm. and they plant it as hedges and it lives and it's Uh, from year in and year out. Whereas if I leave a rosemary plant out, it's going to get snowed on and it's going to turn black and die. And that's the end of that. It'd be over. Yeah. Okay. So are frost dates part of the hardiness zone thing, or is that a completely separate thing when reading a tag? 
it's a separate thing. And frost dates do tend to be really what you want to consider more, particularly when you're planting seeds and it really comes in with a lot with vegetables, vegetables and any sort of things that you're going to plant from seed. And as well as anything that's not what we would say is frost tender. So things when they get frosted, what that does is the water inside the cells freezes, expands, those cells break, they die. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of how that works. So we don't want that. We want our plants (laughs) to not die. So we don't want to put them outside if they have a chance to get frosted. And so frost dates, again, these are averages and they're different for your area. So the place to find that out, there's lots of places, but like oldfarmersalvanac.com is a good place to find out your Mm -hmm. last frost dates. But again, they're averages. So you have to kind of take it all with a grain of salt because it's easily like 30% chance that it can frost after the last frost date. It happens. We have these late frosts. That happened in New York last year we were like waiting and waiting (laughs) for the frost to be over. Well, and when it happens too, it can be really detrimental to lots and lots of plants, not just the annuals. Around here, I live in orchard country, a late frost, when a plant perennials, they go dormant and trees and shrubs, they go dormant for the winter and their dormancy protects them from all that coldness. They pull all the energy down into their roots and they're what we call dormant. When they start to bloom out and leaf out in the spring and they get buds on them and all these things, they're no longer dormant. And they're doing that because the warmer weather is triggering them to do that and their natural life cycle is triggering them to do that. And then occasionally we get these crazy last frosts and it will like zap those buds. And, you know, I live across the street from a huge orchard and they'll lose an entire crop of peaches, Mm -hmm. for example, because of a late frost. Or another one a lot of people always ask me about around here, older varieties of hydrangeas. They would always ask me, why are my hydrangeas not blooming? And it's typically would be because there would be a late frost and hydrangeas, the older varieties, they would bloom on old wood, we call it. So like the plant would grow blooming stems the first year. And then the second year, those blooming stems would be blooming. And so it Mm -hmm. has two cycles to get damaged, which increases the odds of that frost damage happening. And if it gets damaged in there, you don't get any blooms. So now we have, readers have created hydrangeas that bloom on old and new wood. So even if the old wood gets damaged, the likelihood of the second year also is less. So you'll still get blooms. Got it. Yeah, pizza horticulture. (laughs) That's wild. Yeah. Okay, so knowing the last frost date is important so that you don't plant too early and then shock the plants? Well, not just shock the plants, but if you've grown seedlings like inside somewhere, there's a shock issue. And then what you want to be doing is hardening things off. So they're going from your nice warm house or somewhere like that out to this cooler area, even though it's past the frost date, you still need to kind of get them used to that. So the plants Mm -hmm. don't like that quick change, but you definitely don't want to put them out when they can actually still get frosted. So that's the other thing. But also if you plant seeds in the ground, if it's still too cold, those seeds won't germinate until it gets to a certain temperature. So It's also good to know for that kind of thing, because you don't want to plant your seeds too early and then they just sit there and they don't Mm -hmm. germinate because it's too cold. Got it. Because a lot of them get activated by that warming of the soil. Right. Right. Okay, cool. So in your opinion, what's more important to know your last frost date or your zone? Both of them are extremely important, but I think if you're planning like a vegetable garden, the most important thing is your last frost date for sure. If you're doing bigger, wider garden of all the things, perennials and all that kind of other stuff, then you really need to know both. Okay. Plant friends, I have to say, I love when our sponsor partners happen to line up beautifully with both of each other. And I can't think of two better plant friend companies than Territorial Seed and Espoma Organic. Supporting sponsors is a great way to support Bloom and Grow. So if you are going to be starting your outdoor garden this season, I highly suggest checking them out. So thank you so much to Espoma Organics. It's a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. They are good people. We are are definitely getting ready for our spring and summer gardens these days. And Espoma has all of the potting soils, garden and lawn fertilizers, and organic pest controls for you, your home, and your gardens. 
They've got potting mixes and gardening mixes tailored to your garden setup, whether you're gardening in ground with raised beds or containers. And they're all enhanced with performance boosting ingredients like mycotone, yucca extract, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, feather meal, earthworm casings that will set you up for big, beautiful, lush plants. And they're probably best known for their Espoma Tone lines. You probably all know about Holly Tone, but they also have the Biotone Starter Plus, which is a perfect product to use while starting your gardens. And they have long lasting organic fertilizers just to set you and your plants up for success. To top it all off, this company has a huge sustainability commitment with a 100% solar powered plant, zero waste manufacturing and eco-friendly packaging. Can you tell I like them? I really like them. Go check them out for their indoor and outdoor products. Visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are or click the link in the show notes to go to the Bloom and Grow Espoma Amazon storefront with all my faves. Thank you, Territorial Seed Company, for sponsoring today's episode. Plant Friends, if you are looking for a reliable, family-run seed and plant provider that ships directly to your door for your garden this season, Territorial Seed Company is the answer to your prayers. I'm so thankful to be partnering with this amazing company for my first outdoor garden this year and taking my first real step at starting my own seeds. Oh, I'm so excited about it. I'm having so much fun. I'm so intrigued that Territorial Seed Company actually produces 25% of their own seed varieties on their 75-acre certified organic research farm. This ensures highest quality because the farm is in Oregon, and because of the specific climate in Oregon, the varieties that thrive there are most likely to flourish just about anywhere across the country, and they tend to be super hardy, vigorous, and productive crops. And if you aren't into starting your own seeds, I totally get it. Territorial Seed Company also grows and ships actual plants, seedlings, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, herbs, flowers, shipped directly to your door. And they have 100% guarantee, so there's no risk if something goes wrong in shipping. And if you want to go next level and start seeds but not have the hassle of everything else you need to get, they have their no-brainer urban garden container, which comes with everything you need to get growing in one convenient package. The container, seeds, fertilizer, growing media, all of it. So check out their amazing variety of seeds, plants, garden planters, and more on TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM10 to get 10% off your first order. Once again, that's code BLOOM10 to get 10% off your first order. Okay, let's get back to Rochelle. So I know that my zone is 7B. I know that my last frost date is end of May, or I've been told by local gardeners, it's like kind of mid, late May, but all the local Mm -hmm. gardeners say, wait till end of May to plant. What do I have to do with that information? So how do I plan a garden? Someone like me, who's a novice, like knowing that. So one thing that you want to pay attention to, like if you're doing vegetables, for example, but basically it's going to tell you like a seed packet will tell you the number of days until you're going to get like the fruit or the vegetable Mm -hmm. or the flower even. And it'll say that right on the package, like how long that is. So if you live in an area, like say you live in Alaska and it's really late until that last frost date is like maybe in June or something. But then your first frost date is also really early. So you only have this growing season that's maybe like 80 days or something like that. Whereas someplace like me, we have 150 plus days. You're not even going to be able to grow certain vegetables because you don't have long enough for that variety to grow and do its thing before it's going to get killed back again. So you want to pay attention, not just last frost date, which happens in the spring, but also first frost date and know what the Mm -hmm. time between the two are so that you're not trying to plant something that needs longer than you have before you get what you're trying to get. The frost dates really apply mostly to vegetables that you're planting from seed usually or whatever. The other thing is you can work around that a little bit. So that's why people start things early. Because if they start them early in their house, then they're adding that time to the length of their growing season. So that in between the two frost dates, that's your growing season. If your growing season isn't particularly long, you can extend it by starting seeds early inside. You start seeds early and you get them larger so that when you put them in the ground right after your last frost date, they're like already farther along and they will fruit exactly faster. Okay. Yes. Because yes. I'm having some FOMO right now because I can't plant basically until early June, end of May, early June. Right. Most of the seeds that I want to grow are 30 to 60 days before transplant. So I know mm-hmm. in my head that I shouldn't be seed starting until the beginning of April, right? Right. 
Right. But I'm seeing right. all my friends on YouTube already starting their seeds, but I'm trying to remind myself, no, because if you start your seeds now, you're going to get your plants too big. So is that something that I can run into? Because also if I grow them indoors too long, like my tomato plants too full, then they're probably not going to transition very well, right? Well, you know, what tends to happen more than anything in my experience I like to stick with stuff that I could just plant outside directly. But Mm -hmm. when I get lazy and I go to the garden center and I buy my peppers and tomatoes (laughs) as Uh little plants, but things that are smaller, first of all, will establish better. So that's just when a plant has kind of a small root system and a small amount of top, those things are in balance. Like that root system is supporting all of that above Mm -hmm. ground sort of stuff. If you have a lot going on up above and then you put them into the stress of transplanting, they're trying to keep all of that alive on that same relatively small that was in your tiny little pot root system. And it stresses them out a lot more. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the reason for that. Plus, I think a lot of people, when you're growing indoors, usually you don't have the best light situation. I mean, even when you have a lot of grow lights and stuff like that, after a while, like they'll come up and they'll be great until like a certain height. After that, like particularly things like tomatoes, they tend to get leggy and they don't have as strong as stems after they've been indoors for too long and they just get floppy and they're just not going to be as healthy because they've just kind of been in that less than ideal situation for just a little bit too long. So getting them outside where they get better light and kind of better everything at the right time usually benefits you because you have to really pay attention to them once they start to get of a certain size indoors. They're more demanding. They want more water. They want more light. They want more of everything. And it's harder to get them what they need when they get bigger. Okay. Indoors. This is good to hear. It's affirming me in what I've been thinking because all I care about is growing tomatoes this summer. I'm just going to probably do salad, herbs, and tomatoes, and maybe some cukes or zucchinis. So like all I care about is whether or not I get good <laughs> good tomato yeah. plants. So it sounds like yeah. I'm doing it correctly. I'm going to wait until yeah, it's patient. time to plant just to get them to their small seedlings and then transfer yeah. them outside. It's hard to wait. I know I'm always pushing. I have a good friend who gardens near me. Maybe you know him, Matt Mattis. He's written many gardening books. Oh, okay. He lives just south of me. He's lived here in Massachusetts his whole life, whereas I lived elsewhere. Um, I'm a gambler too. I'm always like, oh, I know that last frost date is two weeks, but it feels nice out and I don't think it's going right. to frost. You know, I win that gamble sometimes, but sometimes I don't. And he takes the other extreme. He's like, you know, you should wait for two more weeks after that frost date to really make sure. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. So you can compare and contrast. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you could lose things. He's never willing to lose things. I'm kind of more like, well. (laughs) That's why you make extras, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so with hardiness zones, frost dates, what else do we need to know with garden planning? Anything else we haven't covered? Well, I did want to say there's a caveat, sort of a better way. You know, we talked about the USDA hardiness zones and the AHS heat zones. If you live anywhere, there's another one that's called the sunset zones. They call them the sunset climate zones. Okay. Sunset Magazine created them. And they are arguably, well, particularly for the West, which is where Sunset Magazine focuses on all of those, like California, all the way to Colorado and everything sort of in the West. What they have done, they created a whole bunch of zones that take in all kinds of factors. So they take into account the heat and the cold, but also like moisture and elevation and humidity and all kinds of things. So it's a really, really useful overall kind of indicator of whether a plant is going to work for your area or not. I mean, it's hands down better than the USDA zones. Oh, okay. But the thing is, I know that the map exists. And right before this call, I was like, I want to go see what my sunset zone is. The problem is, is in the East, they're just not that common and we don't hear about it as much. It's the sunset zones aren't as popular or used. They do exist, but it's, we do have zones that cover our area. We just don't see that here and they don't, people don't use them as much, but if you're in the West, that's like what everybody uses and they're really, really good. So if you're kind of Colorado and West, interesting, use the sunset zones because they're better, much better. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I want to hit you with some listener questions before we troubleshoot my garden, because I might learn from the listener questions. 
This was something interesting. What about microclimate? So Mike, one of our Patreon supporters asked, how much does microclimate affect your predicted garden zones? So a microclimate, so you have your, you know, you are gardening in a climate, in an ecosystem, in a particular set of conditions that, you know, are where you live. And we've given you some information about it by telling you what your hardiness zone is, but there's other things that we talked about that you don't know that like all those climate things that Sunset Magazine is in, like your heat, your, the rain and the humidity and all these other things. So microclimates, so basically you've got the climate that's around you and that is something, but in um, certain areas, and it could be your whole garden could be a microclimate. Or it could be little areas within your garden. You could have all kinds of microclimates going on. And basically what we're talking about is a pocket or a little area that's sort of different from everything else in some way that's around it. So for example, if you're down in a valley, a lot of times you might be in a microclimate because the cold will settle into the valley. And so you might have more coldness than maybe something that's halfway up the valley. And so you would have to adjust for that. That's a microclimate. Or if you live on a lake or on the coast, usually the coast is the hardiness zone is takes into account. But say you live on a lake, that body of water is going to moderate the temperatures in the areas right around the lake. And they're not going to get as hot and cold. So you might have a microclimate. You might have a microclimate if you're in an urban area and you're gardening in between two buildings, it might be colder because it never gets any sun, or it might be hotter because yeah. like the sun is constantly reflecting off a nearby building or something like that. Mm-hmm. You also get microclimates for wind. So like people will see microclimates on the edges of fences or things that are blocking the wind because wind flow, it's like aviation coming in here. Mm-hmm. It gets faster as it goes around a surface, like a corner of a fence. You plant something where that wind is coming. If you have a prevailing wind that's whipping around the corner of that fence, you might find that your zone, you know, plants that you might expect would survive in your zone can't survive there because it's just that much colder because of that extra wind. So it's these areas that can basically, you can adjust your microclimate or your microclimates can make your climate like one whole zone different in either direction Mm -hmm. as much as that it really can. So they can be quite dramatic. And how can I tell if I'm in a microclimate? Is there some website that tells me, or it's like intuition? Really, you kind of got to pay attention. And if something doesn't work that you thought should work, you know, that's a good clue to start asking yourself that, now why is that working? It's definitely good to talk to local, not like your big box store, but like your local garden center they'll be able to kind of guide you. I mean, just being able to recognize them, like urban areas are often warmer microclimates in general, just because there's a lot of paving and things that are reflecting heat and creating that heat island effect. Bodies of water are things to look for. Anything that accelerates or decelerates wind, that will cause a little microclimate. And it can be really little, like the fence example, like that might only affect like 10 square feet of your garden. Mm -hmm. That's all it affects you'll notice it. Like I live on top of a hill and I have these prevailing winds that come up and I notice it in the winter. There are days when literally like 50 feet on either side of my driveway, there'll be frost. And then I go beyond as I'm going downhill in either direction and the frost goes away. I'm like, literally just the top of my little hill is frosty right now. Everybody else is a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just kind of need to pay attention in general and ask yourself, is there something funky going on here? Or if you see sort of unexpected behavior. Okay. I guess you're only going to learn with playing with plants and trying stuff out and seeing what works and stretching a little bit. So speaking of stretching, another Patreon supporter, Daniel said, what methods can be used to push gardening zones if a plant is hardy just outside your gardening zone? Yeah. So the same sort of thing is the microclimates. You might want to try and create a microclimate try some of the things that will stretch a microclimate to the warm. Like I have an asphalt driveway. It'll be a little bit warmer next to that asphalt driveway than it will be further away because of the Mm -hmm. reflected heat, even all winter long. So you can try and identify where the microclimates might be based Mm -hmm. on some of the conditions you have. Or if you have a pond, that's another thing. Even a little pond will make a little microclimate around. Wow. And it'll warm it up. So it'll increase your hardiness Zone. zone. 
Right. Wow. Right. Or even just a sunny area as opposed to a shady area. If you've got an area of your yard that is just like constantly in the sun, 100% of the time, all year round, and you'll notice this like around here, like which area melts the snow the fastest and which area does the snow stay the latest? Like, I know that just because I've lived here a few years. It's like, well, the snow over on that side of the house is here forever, but over there, it's definitely not. So that's a different little microclimate. And you kind of just learn by paying attention. Okay. So yes, sometimes these can be quite dramatic. Fences can definitely screen winds. So if you have a wind problem that's causing you to have, if you put a fence and you put something on the inside of that fence, that can Mm -hmm. protect it. People wrap things to protect them. That's not something I generally recommend just because it's not terribly sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, you're planting something that without your babying is just not going to survive. And eventually things happen and, you know, you're going to probably lose that. You brought up sunlight. I'm struggling so much right now because we moved December 30th. Mm -hmm. So there's two different locations that I'm considering putting my garden in and I cannot figure out which one gets the more light because there are no leaves on the trees right now. So I'm like praying that these trees grow in a little bit so I can kind of assess like what is the sunnier because they're both in these cleared plots, basically in the middle of a forest. So they're surrounded by mm-hmm. trees. So I know shade is going to be an issue, but mm-hmm. I can't figure it out until the leaves grow back. And also the sun, the arc of the sun is going to change in the spring. So I'm very stressed yeah. about it. Are you an iPhone user or an Android user? iPhone. iPhone. Okay. That doesn't know. There is an app that I saw a demo of for Android users. It's not available on iPhone. I've, I've seen nothing like it, but it was this very cool app. I will not be able to tell you the name, but I can send it to you for Okay, we'll uh, put it in the show notes. But anyway, it's just for Android users, but it's this really cool app that I think it costs like $7 or something like that. And basically you take these pictures. So you can do this any time of the year. You take a pictures and it walks you through like, like how you're supposed to take these pictures of like where your garden is and it uses lat long coordinates on the earth. And then you take a picture of the tree line like a pano picture. And it does all this mathematical calculation to tell you how many hours of sunlight you're going to get in the spot. You're kidding me. No, it's the coolest thing. I will freaking buy an Android phone (laughs) to figure that out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's a cool, cool app. Please send me that app. We'll put it in the show notes. I'm sure people are going to freak out over it. Yeah. Yeah. The guy that developed it, it, it really was developed by this guy who's like a retired scientist, engineer type, and his wife wanted to know this. And so he like, this was like a retirement figured project. It out. Like, figured it oh, out and so wrote this cool. like computer program, but it's just on Android. So. Okay. We'll figure it out. We'll find some hacks. I'll reach out. I'll yeah. reach out to them. Yeah. One more. Tina wants to know, have zones changed because of climate change? Yeah. Yeah, they have. So I think there's been like three times that the USDA zones changed since like the 60s. So there was one release in like 67 and then there's like one in like 90s, 1990 or something. And then the most recent one was 2012. And in yes, 2012, I, yeah. In my zone, when I typed in on the USDA map, my zone said I'm 5B as of 2012, but on 1990, I was 5A. Yeah, yeah. So I was five before and now I'm six. Wow. In 2012, which just to say though, I take that with a huge grain of salt, because as I said before, I live on top of a hill and I think my garden still very much behaves like zone five, but it's just this little top of the hill pocket. Mm -hmm. So my microclimate has always been a little harsher Mm -hmm. than the zone in general. So take these hardiness zones and they're good, valuable information, but you know, your own observations and experiences, you kind of really got to give yourself some credit for that and don't second guess what you can kind of know and see obviously for yourself as well. I can't reliably grow zone six stuff here. I've tried as soon as I switched, I was like, oh, well, we're going to the nursery and right. I lost lots of stuff. Because zone six is geared for warmer. So your yeah. cold was still acting like a five, which is colder. Wow, that's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's plant by plant too, by the way, just to say, so some zone six stuff works fine because that plant's particular characteristics are such a way that it will work fine in this kind of, you know, maybe it doesn't like the heat, but it tolerates the colder, you know, it just depends on the plant. You never know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in general, I'm really cautious, even though I'm supposedly zone six, I'm very cautious about zone six plants where I live. That's super interesting. 
Yeah. So as we wrap up, I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about garden design because you have a whole course on it and you've dedicated your whole life to it. What would be like your biggest tip to give a newbie gardener on designing their first garden? Oh, my favorite tip that kind of always just like blows people's minds is everybody does the same thing when they start figuring out they've got a new plot of land, they've got a backyard or a front yard or whatever, and they know where their property lines are and they start imagining what this garden can be from the edges Mm -hmm. in. That's Mm -hmm. what we start to do. We start thinking about that. And that's just the worst way to design a garden in general. (laughs) It's just completely backwards. You should, without question, figure out what you want Like, do you want a grass patch? Do you want a vegetable garden? Do you need activity areas of different types or gathering areas? So you need to kind of figure out what you want and then start in the middle and work your way out and laying in all the stuff. And the reason for that is because property lines are crazy and they're not made for garden design. Mm -hmm. They don't make for nice layouts. They can be wonky and weird and have nooks and crannies and not straight and all those things. And so if you build off of those lines, which everybody's always tempted to do, you're going to have weird wonky gardens and stuff that like feels tricky and like little nooks that are hard to water. Create what you want. And then you can basically fill the whole outside edge with plants and hide all those edges Mm -hmm. and it'll all feel nice. I mean, planting beds like hide all sins basically. And whatever, it doesn't matter what the property lines are doing anymore because you've laid out what you wanted first. I love that. So that would be my biggest tip. I love that. Start in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's like, I'm just really focused on my little raised beds that I'm going to do because I don't own the property. But I feel like another thing a lot of just edible gardeners say is pick what you want to eat and then figure out if you can grow it and then go from there. Don't just like pick whatever, like figure out what you like and what you want. And I'm also trying to focus on like the joy aspect of like, okay, I want some cut flowers to attract pollinators, but like, you know, what kind of vibe do I want going on? But yeah, what is your course? You said you have a garden design course, right? Yeah. So my course is targeted for homeowners who, you know, maybe they would want to hire a garden designer, but maybe they don't have the budget for it, or they want to learn to do it themselves. And so Hiring a designer is not an insignificant proposition cost-wise. So having that sort of professional level of design and doing a full design for your garden, but knowing how to do it yourself. So it's a big course. It takes people months to kind of work their way through it because it is a lot of information. But yeah, that basically for anybody who wants to either design for the first time, or maybe you have a garden that you're looking to redesign or improve the design, all these kinds of things. I have people kind of at all of those ranges. I also have people take the course. I get a huge bunch of people who are like nursery people who, Mm -hmm. you know, just want to help their customers design, but it's a design course. It will teach you about design. So I love that. Well, I can't wait to take it in the next couple of years when we buy our first house. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's perfect for that. Very good. Great. So for those wanting to check out Rochelle's class, you can check out my affiliate link in the show notes. And where else can we find you, Rochelle? You've got a kick-ass Instagram. You've got a lot going on. So where else can we find you? Yeah. So Pith and Vigor, that is the name of my website, blog and Instagram and Pinterest and all of those things which by the way, Pith and Vigor, it's a little play on words with plants. I was just going to ask. Yeah. So where did that come from? And so when I was naming, I had this idea that I wanted this name that was like something and something like two words. I was like just brainstorming lists and lists and lists of things. And I was like trying out like this and that, and you know, just for something that sounded nice. And I had the word Pith and I had the word Vigor and I was like, oh, I like it. And it kind of sounded like Piss and Vinegar. <laughs> it kind of, so I was like, in a mood. I, I don't know. But anyway, I liked the way it sounded. And so of course, like when you use, you know, cause the pith and vigor, like they're both words we talk about with plants. The pith is like the central heart mm-hmm. core of a plant's stem and vigor. We, we talk about vigor, like, is it growing healthy? vigorously? Is it, yeah. is it vigorously? Yeah. Does a plant have vigor? Anyway, I did some research on, and this is when what like really hooked me on it because I trying to make sure is anybody else using this term and all that kind of stuff. And so I was doing all these like word searches and things like that. And I did come across it in these like books from the 1700s. There was this term that people used called pith and vigor. And then there was like these websites where people who study the origins of words, the etymology, 
is entomologists that study insects and etymologists that study mm-hmm. words. I think that's right. Anyway, so there were people who study words and like how do words evolve? And so this language of pith and vigor was in these old, old texts. And so there was this whole discussion of like, what did people who are experts in like the history of language think that was meant by that? And and this is the part that I just thought was so cool. Basically, the what they thought it meant was that it was a term for having like this kind of like braveness and this sort of kind of spirit to you because what it referred to in the, at the time, if you pissed something, that was like a term it meant to kill something by cutting out the spine. Mm-hmm. Basically, it was kind of this violent sort of thing, but to pith something. And so what they thought is... That basically if something had pith and vigor it was sort of meant to say that like, even though it had its like spine ripped out, it's like life cord ripped out, it was still going and it was still wow. like, you know, like it just had this like spirit of like, we can do this and like, I'm going to keep going, you know? And I was like, wow, that's like kind of cool and interesting cool. and old Especially and strange, for garden. But yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I was sold after that. I'm like, I love that. And it's all old and nobody uses it anymore. So I brought it back. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, everyone yeah. should go check out the blog and the Instagram and the Pinterest and your course is linked in the show notes. So thank you so much yeah. for shedding so much light on this topic. I've been confused by it for a long time. So I appreciate You're welcome. you educating us and I'll keep you posted on how my 5B garden progresses. Yeah. Good luck. I think you'll do well. <laughs> it's you. not that hard. you got this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rochelle. This was amazing. It was hugely informative. It's so interesting that it was so 101, but we just covered so much. I just thought it was such an enlightening conversation. Rochelle is amazing. You can check out all of her links in the show notes. I am so excited to be diving into my 5A zone and patiently awaiting my frost date. I'm really struggling. I'm trying to convince Mama Faella to come up to my house and help me in the planting up. Since our talk, I went to Old Farmer's Almanac the way she suggested, and my last spring frost is May 14th, and the first fall frost is October 1st, so that gives me 139 days of a growing season. So for me, this means I'm going to start most of my seeds, actually, at the time this episode probably airs, and I will hopefully plant them in late May. Local gardeners have told me, because I've made some plant friends locally, that it's important to be patient up here. And even though our frost date is May 14th, it frequently frosts after it. So most farmers wait till the end of May to plant their gardens up. But if you're curious about everything we talked about today, I highly recommend going to almanac.com slash gardening. It had so much amazing information. Like I said, I'm really enjoying being a novice again at this outdoor gardening thing. I can't wait to share my experience with you guys and have you grow alongside me. If you have gardening advice for me, I'd love to connect with you on Instagram. It's so fun to learn from you guys. I know this is a primarily houseplant-focused podcast, but we have some really impressive outdoor gardeners as well in our community. So connect with me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio and give me all your gardening tips. Can't wait. I wish you all the most plantiest weeks. I hope that you get to disconnect from your screens and reconnect with yourselves and nature through spending time with your plants because screen addiction is real. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. 
You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing.